Welcome back to Needham. Today, I wanna to talk about a couple things. Number one, we're gonna talk about our reclaimed beams, how we're installing them, and why it's really important to install them the way that we're doing it. Uh, we're also gonna head upstairs and check in on the blue board progress. I wanna talk about our vapor membrane that we've installed here on the interior of the walls, and we're gonna share with you guys what we achieved for air tightness prior to putting up wallboard. Before we tore down the old house, we actually went into the home and took out a bunch of the timbers uh, that we wanted to save and potentially reuse for furniture. And as the excavator was pulling down the home and doing the demolition, we actually tied a chain to it and pulled out some of the big eight by eights and eight by nines that were in some of the structure. We didn't really have a plan for what we were gonna do with them, so we put them underneath the tarp out in the backyard. Now they've been inside for a couple weeks and we are using them for some architectural elements. So I'm standing in one of the home offices and we're gonna be using them as faux collar ties. The framing that you're looking at below the insulation in the roof is actually to drop the ceiling down a little bit. The roof is actually pitched much higher, but you can see our, our carpenters have installed blocking between these rafters. These beams are actually gonna go up, if you were to picture this as full width, and it's going, they're gonna sit this edge onto that shelf. Uh, the nice part about that is now all of the weight of this beam going from rafter to rafter is all being supported by a shelf. That blocking is actually installed with some structural screws. And then once this is installed, they're actually gonna come down on the top of it uh, and install a, a block on top so this beam can't go anywhere. Now, why is that important? Well, these aren't structural. They are considered faux beams or faux collar ties because they're not doing anything from a structure perspective, but we de definitely don't want them to fall. And being that these are spanning a pretty big width, we wanna make sure they're anchored on both ends to be super secure. If you're watching this and say, well, of course you don't want them to fall. That, why, that's, that's a pretty stupid comment. I've seen them fall before and I've seen uh, people put beams up on the ceiling and have put them in with finished nails, not necessarily something like this, but a box beam. There's still weight to it. Your home moves. You have to be consider, You have to consider those things when installing something like this. So you want to make sure you take the time to really think this thing, this, think this through in a way that is supported and also allows the structure to move and still have that support necessary. And in its final condition, we'll actually cut the ceiling around that beam. By putting the ceiling in after, you're gonna get that authentic look of the ceiling coming up against the beam and seeing this pass through into the structure of the house. Now, this is one condition of beams. Let's head out to the entryway uh, because we have our beams going up in the ceiling there. It's a little bit different of a condition. So out here in the entry four-way, we actually have new timber. So back in the office, they're actually reclaimed from the old building. Here, we actually ordered some hemlock rough sawn and we're installing them in the foyer as well as in the hallway and the kitchen and other areas, other parts of the home. Now, what we have here is a beam that's actually pressed up flat against the, the floor framing. Now, walking through in, in, or kind of looking at what you, we have going on here, you see this plywood up on top of the beam here. This is the actual connection point to our framing. If you look closely, there's about a five eighths gap from that plywood to the top of the beam. Our guys actually installed a strip of five eighths plywood on top of the beam prior to installing that three quarter inch plywood. Now, all of that's put together with some structural screws. I even think I saw some Fastmaster flat locks on that and some PL. And what that's going to do is essentially give them the opportunity to put this up against the ceiling and attach it to the framing with all of that screwed from above. What that does is it eliminates the need for any exposed fasteners or, or blending something in and trying to hide a screw. Now, what's the 5 8 gap for? The 5 8 gap is to accomplish similar to the office, the authentic look of the ceiling being above the beam. Rather than having to put a uh, stop bead against the, the side of the beam, we actually have an area for them to take the blue board and slide it up and into that 5 8 gap. We'll be using a half inch blue board on the ceiling and then a veneer coat plaster. You guys are gonna ask why we use plaster. It's just what we do. They'll veneer coat plaster into that 5 8 gap and then screwed across. And then that way we're eliminating the need to install any stop bead or any additional trim. Gives us a nice ending point. A couple things to, to note here. So you have this big open uh, for you. It's not perfectly symmetrical on either side, uh, but what we're doing is we're starting with a center beam. And that center beam is kind of our fixed point. Uh, it lands right above the center window and comes back and lands above this archway. From there, those two, the, the next two beams are actually pushed out and they're intended to line up here with our finished condition of our plaster. So that plaster corner bead's gonna come up 
and align with the outside of that beam. It's, it's that small little intentional detail that will look really good on the final condition, whereas if it were halfway over and we shrunk that area, uh, it might have looked as though you know, it wasn't authentic or, or it was less authentic because the reality is, is if that were a true beam, there would be some sort of post coming down on the corner of this wall. Now, what that did is it actually shrunk the, the space between this beam and that beam. Number one, it's minor, but number two, it is intentional with that corner. And number three, you have this beam here that actually is pressed up against our stair opening. So one of the conversations that we had is, well, let's make, let's think this thing through and think about how all of these details come together. Uh, and one of them was this beam here was originally gonna end on the outside corner of this wall. What we determined is that, well, all of these beams are a fixed length. Let's call them 12 feet. And this one here would get cut off about 12 inches. Then you have this 11 foot beam that would stop on the outside corner. Instead, we actually shifted it in this direction so that beam went all the way to our exterior wall, keeping all of them the same length. So what that does on the, the stairway side is we actually come down and we have an outside corner and that, that plaster ceiling ties back into that 5 8 gap. Why is that important? Well, that's gonna be a wall color and that wall color coming down, if that beam were flush, would be a really difficult detail to go from a nice flush painted plaster to a you know aligned piece of rough sawn. Stepping it back gave it the opportunity to switch from wall to ceiling and then go into this beam pattern across the entryway. Now these beams actually continue into the hallway uh, and then the guys are actually prepping the kitchen right now and we'll have a similar detail. So speaking of blue board and plaster, we're gonna head upstairs. Here on the second floor, we got in all of the, the blue board delivered last week and the guys are getting set up and hanging the board this week in preparation for plaster. So what blue board is, cause a lot of you guys ask, it's very similar to drywall uh, and to the untrained eye, maybe you would consider it the same. Uh, but essentially it has a different coating on this. So drywall is typically a light gray. You might have a purple or green for moisture. Uh, blue board is gonna be more of a darker gray uh, or even in the tone of blue, hence the name. But the reason that paper is a different color is that it's actually made up of a different um, chemical compound, which is designed to absorb plaster differently. Plaster is moisture cure. So you don't want the, the board to be sucking the moisture out too quickly because then the plaster doesn't dry pr appropriately. So blue board is specifically designed to be veneer coat plastered. Veneer coat meaning that we will screed an entire coat of plaster across the whole wall. They're typically using a 14 inch trowel and burnishing that plaster. Uh, it's really beautiful. It's what we do here in Massachusetts. Uh, in all of our homes. We'll be doing a single coat plaster. So in some of the other homes, you've seen us do uh, true two coat. On, on this home, it's not as important uh, to get ultra flatness. Now that doesn't mean we don't do a good job. Obviously our framing uh, has to be dialed in. Our team has actually went around and checked every stud for uh, plumbness as well as flatness to, to make sure that the board hangers are prepped for success. Uh, and if the board's flat and then the guys come behind it with plaster, that plaster is gonna be flat. So we're still taking all of the same steps to get there, but we're just not doing a true two coat to make sure that everything is absolutely dead flat because it's just not necessarily necessary on this project. So boards being hung, uh, they will go around and it's a traditional drywall screw. Everything will get screwed to the wall. And then prior to plaster, they will actually mesh tape all of the seams and screw heads to prevent any screw popping. And then they'll get into plaster. But let me talk to you a little bit about our role as the builder and more specifically Mike's role as a super on this job. We've installed the Sega Myrex on all of our exterior walls, the uh, wrist and tape on any of the seams. It's really, really important for us as the builder to communicate to the next trade you know what we've done prior to that and how important those steps are for example we don't want them coming in here and say there's a bulge in the wall they don't, we don't want them cutting that before the, they put the board up because this is our air barrier it is a smart vapor membrane so uh, moisture does pass in both directions, but I'm not gonna get that technical on this. We do not wanna cut this. We do not wanna penetrate this. Uh, and oftentimes in inside corners is where it gets tricky. And we see, we've seen it before, is they'll come and slice the tape in the corner to get their, their board really tight. So Mike's done a good job communicating that, it, hey, if there's anything, any 
issue behind this wall or something that is you know preventing you from installing your board flat come to me so we can address it and then that way if we do have to slice this uh, we open it up we address what needs to be done we put that slice back and then we can tape that seam and we're in in great shape so speaking of air tightness there's a lot of uh, comments about this and that homes are built too tight the, the facts are the facts that is just simply not the case mike had our hers rater come out and do a blower door test prior to us uh, putting the board up this is the last opportunity we have to address anything that could potentially be a leak in the wall so we want to pressurize the house and figure out where those leaks are so they do the blower door test and then and if that blower door test is too high we're going to run around with a fog machine and figure out where that air is escaping and then that way we can address that uh, we want to make sure that you know we are at the air tightness level that we're trying to achieve and for this home we were trying to achieve at least a one ach uh, per 50 and and for us that was our target because of the complications of this home this is not a passive level home but we did take a lot of practices to make sure that we were incredibly airtight uh, kudos to the team because they pulled that off and they got a 0.83 uh, before board meaning that this home is extremely tight uh, and what that means for the the end user is that this home is going to be really comfortable because we're going to be able to maintain the climate within the home a lot easier because we've captured the, the envelope in a really tight way. Uh, and then from here, we get to control what air goes in and what air goes out. And I've done a video on this before, but essentially rather than filtering outside fresh air through your wall cavities, we're bringing outside air and filtering it through an ERV system. Two to be exact on this project, one on the second floor, one on the first floor. Uh, and what that's going to do is it's going to bring in fresh air from the outside. It's going to filter all the particles out of it and it's going to disperse it into the, the, the living rooms. And when I say living rooms, I mean bedrooms and living spaces. Uh, and, at, and at the same time, it's going to be exhausting stale air out of things like the kitchen and bathrooms. It's going to do that on a constant basis, always making sure that we have fresh air in the home and doing it in a really controlled way and a filtered way. Because ultimately, to talk about comfort, we want this to be a healthy home for our end user. Big milestone. Kudos to the entire team for getting it to this level. Uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be boarding and plastering. And our team of carpenters, is, uh, they're going to be rolling into all of our v-groove ceilings and then right behind that we have an entire Cucum brothers molding package showing up uh, and we'll be trimming out this house uh, for a couple months so stay tuned